Uh, Somos del Señor, which is translated, We Are the Lord's, uh, which goes along with our theme that we're beginning a, a series in the book of Corinthians. So we'll be in the next four or five weeks or so in the book of Corinthians, Lord willing, with the theme, We Belong to Christ. We Belong to Christ. And today our title of this, of course, uh, is uh, You Are Not Lacking. Uh, there's a story, a kind of a funny story I read uh, about a lady who uh, was in traffic and she was behind this guy. She didn't feel like he was going fast enough and moving fast enough at the stoplights and he was trying to obey the traffic laws and uh, so uh, sometimes you know some of us when we get to the, the light turns yellow we think that means speed up. Uh, you know, and, and so, but this fellow, he slowed down and stopped like he was supposed to and st started when he was supposed to. This, this woman was just furious. And she was blowing a horn and uh, cussing and screaming at him and, and uh, really upset. And uh, it was causing her to drive erratic and just be, uh, you know, irrational. And finally, she's at this uh, stop sign behind this guy and a Guy pecks on the window, she looks out, and it's an officer. And he tells her to get out of the car and put her hands up, and he uh, handcuffs her, puts her in the squad car, and takes her to jail. And he's sitting there, and as, as she's sitting there in jail, finally the arresting officer comes out, unhandcuffs her, and he says, I, I have to apologize. I thought, it, it, when I saw you, uh, I, I, I looked on your car and you had uh, what would Jesus do bumper sticker on the back of your car. You had uh, honk if you love Jesus bunk, bumper sticker on your car. You had a uh, right for life sticker on your car and an ichthus, a fish uh, representing the Christian. And I just assumed that the car was stolen. Well, Sometimes we fail to live up to our potential and to the way that we're supposed to live in Christ. You know, there is this expectation of others that Christians are going to act like Christians. We don't always do that. But when we don't, it presents a picture that doesn't look good on the church. And uh, so, uh, with that in mind, we're thinking about the Corinthian church. Uh, the Corinthian church was a church that uh, had problems. They had a lot of problems in, in the church. And they, uh, Paul begins in this letter to remind them of their position and their calling, and yet they aren't really measuring up to that. And I think it's interesting. And if you have your Bibles, uh, today we're going to use our Bibles a little bit. So it's going to be in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1. And we are really just in the salutation, the first nine verses. And I hope you don't mind, but you really could do a series just on the salutation. And so Paul opens the letter as a traditional Pauline style and uh, talking about his um, credentials. Paul called him to be an apostle of Jesus Christ. And so he is uh, an apostle and he's speaking with some authority here. It's not just some Joe off the street. He is an apostle. And so uh, they have a reason to listen to him. And then he mentions uh, Sothenes, our brother. Now, why did he mention Sothenes? Uh, who is Sothenes after all? Uh, we don't know a whole lot. We really don't know much at all about Sothenes. It doesn't really tell us much. He doesn't go in. But it was important enough for him to mention it in the text and in his letter. And Sothenes, uh, the only place that, that we know of that he's mentioned is in Acts 18, 17. Uh, he was possibly the ruler of the synagogue. And he had been beaten and, uh, because of a mob felt like they weren't getting what they wanted. Uh, and also, if this is the same guy, he became a believer, probably under Paul's ministry. And so what you have here is a fellow who was a very prominent ruler, some loved and some hated, no doubt, 
who became a believer in Christ and his life was changed. And so Paul, in a way, is, is telling them about, number one, I've got a brother here and we're, we're greeting you, but also I want you to see the power of God to be able to change lives. So he begins the letter right off talking about the power of God. Uh, to the church of God. The church of God. So he, he addresses them as, as the church of God which is at Corinth. And so the Corinthians, the church at Corinth. And then he says this, to them that are sanctified. The word sanctified means to set apart, to be set apart for holy use. Anytime something has been sanctified, uh, you know, if you go to someone's house and, and you know, you, you know, mom used to have certain dishes that she would say, you can't use that dish. That's only for special guests. You know, those were, in a sense, sanctified. They were set apart for special use. And then when we have communion, uh, we use the, the bread and the juice. It's sanctified because it's set apart for a special use. You and I are sanctified. Now, we may not feel sanctified, but we are sanctified because God has set us apart for His use. And that's the true of the church in Corinth as well. And he says to them that are sanctified in Christ, and then called to be saints, the special heavenly high calling for each and every one of us. I know that there are people that are uh, inducted into sainthood in, uh, in some organizations, such as the, the Roman Catholic Church. And you have to go through a very uh, strict uh, set of of circumstances and be ordained or appointed as a saint. But actually the Bible says we are saints. You are a saint and I'm a saint. And sometimes we'll say, well, I'm no saint. Well, yes, you are. If you're a Christian, you are a saint. Now, you may not act like a saint, but still you're a saint. With all that in every place is called upon the name of Jesus our Lord. And so together we're saints. Grace be unto you, and peace from God, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, uh, he begins by giving thanks on their behalf. And I love the way that he does this. Rather than attacking them for the problems that they have, he begins to talk about the good things about them first. Recently, we were in a, a, a meeting uh, for boosters for parents, really, at school, and we were sitting around talking, and it was really about trying to raise funds for them to go on their trip and all that. When all of a sudden it turned into kind of a bashing session where they were only bashing the director, and uh, it went from one to the other, and it just kept growing. And finally, uh, you know, Sandy tried to uh, uh, change the subject a couple of times. And they talked about getting with this person, and, you know, we're not the person that hires them or fires them, but. Uh, they, they wanted to get with this person and actually let them have it, you know, their gripes. And I said, you know what? Uh, you know, it's fine to give constructive criticism sometimes. But we also want to make sure that we're not just tearing somebody down, that we're also talking about the good things they're doing. And they have done some wonderful things. And then it kind of changed the mood of, of the group. Because sometimes what happens is we get in this mob mentality where we just want to attack somebody. And, and we just jump on that, that thing. And so Paul begins by saying the good things. Now, we are called to be saints. We're called by God. We're sanctified in all those things. But he also does address the problems in the church. This was a church with problems. And uh, he's going to address those problems, and we're, we're looking at some of those. So, what were the problems in the Corinthian church? Well, first let's talk about what the problems were not. Not sure what's going on. <laughs> the problems, for, what, what, what were the problems and what were the, not the problems? Am I doing something wrong here? All right. First of all, the, the problems were not lack of resources. They weren't lack of resources. They were endowed with a lot of resources in the Corinthian church. Uh, the church of Corinthian, of course, was in the city of Corinth, 
which, which was a seaport. And many, many merchants came by and came through there, and they were in the area of the Aegean Sea. And so as people were traveling through Greece and different places, they would come through this seaport, and they would trade. And so they had a lot of commerce in this city. They had a theater in the city that seated, an, an amphitheater that seated about 20,000 people. They had uh, Oriental. They had people from all over the country, all over the world, uh, including uh, Greek, uh, Oriental, all, just all over the world. So they were very, very uh, kind of a metropolitan place and very well off. Now they had some problems too. It was a, also where the, the temple of Aphrodite and all those things. And so uh, we, we know some of those those issues there that come with with success, also uh, temptation. But the problem was not lack of resources. They had they had the resources. Uh, also, the problem was not lack of ability. The church was not doing what they were supposed to do, but it wasn't because of lack of ability. Because they had been given many spiritual gifts. Uh, he says here in this passage, if you look at verse 7, so that you come behind in no gift. And uh, the conversion that, uh, that we're using today says that you're lacking you are not lacking in anything. And that's the text, uh, the, the title for today. You're lacking in nothing. You are, he's saying you're not lacking in anything because God has given you all these. If you back up, uh, he says in verse 5 that you've been enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge. That you are lacking in nothing. They've been given all these spiritual gifts, and they're lacking in nothing. And if you turn over uh, to chapter 12, there's a whole section on all the gifts. And we're not going to spend any time today on that, but I just want to mention verse 7 there. Chapter 12, verse 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to everyone to profit with all. In other words, everybody has a spiritual gift, at least one. Most of us have more than one. And I actually uh, have a spiritual gift test, and they are fairly accurate. I took it myself the other day. If you'd be interested in taking it, I'll bring it for you, and you can take it home, and we can uh, let you have it. It would also be great for the uh, PPR to have so that we know who, who can do what. But uh, what is your spiritual gift? Have you discovered what your talents and gifts are? Some of us are better at some things than others, right? I mean, uh, some of us could not sing like John. We can't go from high to low like that. It would be a scary thing, you know what I'm saying? Uh, so we understand that. Not all of us are good at organization. Not all of us are good at communication. Not all of us are good at teaching. But we have something that we can offer. Something that's a gift from God that we can that we can give. And I think it's beautiful to watch the body of Christ on Sunday morning and just be in action. And I think when I watch Adam and Samantha up here with the children and people using their different gifts, even people reading and singing and uh, all these things, it's just a beautiful thing. And that's what really he's talking about here. The problem was not a lack of resources. And it wasn't a lack of ability because they had been given all the gifts that they needed to get the job done. Also, it wasn't a problem with the lack of education. People were probably very educated uh, in this city. And uh, so that was not an issue either. He said, you've been enriched, in verse 5, in all utterance, in all knowledge. Education not a problem here wasn't a problem of resources or ability or education. So what was the problem? Well, the problem was, in, in a simple way to say it, was division. It was a divided church. Kind of like the divided Methodist church. You know, they, they were a church that were 
divided very much. And, uh, and so Paul is saying, some, going to address some of these issues, but it's these things that are causing them to have the vision. You can see that in, as we go past the text a little bit, but and he talks about in verse 12, some of you say, I'm of Paul and Apollos, and I'm of Cephas and Christ. Is Christ divided? And so basically there's personality contests and, and uh, conflicts going on in the church where some people were siding with one group and you had these cliques going on. And some say, I'm, I'm, I'm a Paul follower. And some, another one says, well, I, I'm a Cephas follower. And what happens in the church sometimes is you'll have these people that will, will almost begin to cause issues in the church just with what James said was the fiery tongue. The fiery tongue. Because he said the tongue cannot be mastered and it can set on fire, you know, just like a fire in, in the woods. And it is set on fire by hell. It comes from Satan. It comes from an evil place. When you see somebody that is never happy with anything in the church, they're always complaining. Mark those people and try to avoid them as much as you possibly because they are not coming from a good place. Now, most of the stuff I've seen happen, the problems I've seen in churches, and I've pastored now almost 40 years, and I've pastored a lot of different churches, including different denominations. And most of the time when people have come in with problems to the pastor and there's been conflict in the church, it's usually not because the pastor is preaching false doctrine. It's usually not because he's running around and doing something like that. It's usually petty stuff. It's usually, you would be surprised at the conflicts that I've that's seen in churches. You just look it up sometime uh, over silly things. But people will look for those things. Those kind of people will look for something and they will call it, that's what was going on here. And that was exactly the problem in the church. <coughs> um, so, the, the truth of the matter is, in order for a church to really work, you have to work together as a team. <coughs> I, I'm thankful to be in a church where, you know, it doesn't mean that we always have to agree with one another. We don't always agree. But what it means is that we work together for a common goal because we're all in this same team together. And I'm thankful to be in a church where I feel like I don't have to dread going to a board meeting. Where I can uh, even have a disagreement with somebody and still feel like I'm not going to be attacked. I'm, I'm thankful for it. Because I've been in places where that wasn't the case. And so, as we think about it, what needs to happen in order for us to be that kind of church? And, uh, you know, I, I was thinking about the other day, you know, the fact that in 1969 that we put a man on the moon. That was an amazing thing. And that guy got a lot of credit. And all he did was step out off of a step, one giant leap, you know, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. He didn't do a lot, to be honest with you. It was the people at NASA and the people that did all the work behind that to get them to where they are that really did the work. In fact, some of those people are just now starting to be recognized, such as African-American women, if you've seen the movie, I don't remember the name of the movie. Remember? Hidden, figures. But, Hidden figures. Hidden figures. Thank you. But it, it brought out the fact that there were people instrumental in getting them to the moon who were never recognized. But yet, in the background, they were the people that got it done. And in the church today, there's all kinds of people. And I'm thankful today for people uh, like, like Andy uh, Swanson. Uh, who, who wants, who doesn't, and he probably wouldn't want me to bring up his name today, but he wants to remain in the background, but he does a lot of things in the background that we don't even recognize sometimes. But if I were to ask him to come up here and speak today, he would probably walk out the door, I'll be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> because that is not what he, it, that's not his gift. Now, he's a great writer. You know, but getting up in front of people. And so all I'm saying today is we learn to find those gifts and we do those things. But it takes a team to work together. And I, I was, uh, you know, just like T 
Tina reading the passage of scripture today and uh, Melinda. I, I, I think that's a wonderful thing to watch the body of Christ. And I asked Tina and Melinda and both said yes. And Tina said, I want to get more involved. I want to do what I can. That's what a pastor loves to hear. Because the body of Christ working together can get great things done. You know, the, the hospital has a theme now, a kind of a running theme, that together we rise. And regardless of what you may think about the hospital or whatever, it's a true statement. The old saying that, you know, united we can stand, but divided what? We fall. It's just true of a church, too. It really is true of a church. So what does it take to get through these petty things? Well, the answer, I think, is in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. If you, if you don't mind, you can turn there. <coughs> 1 Corinthians 13. Paul says here, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity or love, I become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. None of these things matter if we don't love. And you know what will squall troublemakers? You know what will squall the problems in, that will calm the troubles in the church? Love. You just get the love of Jesus in your heart. You get, you get, maybe some people in the church just need to get saved. <laughs> you know, they just, I, I, you know, uh, just, just get Jesus. Because if you get Jesus in your heart, there's something about it that just makes you want. The old song says, makes me love everybody. Give me that old time religion. Nothing will take the place of a relationship with God. And nothing can make a church run like it's supposed to. Now, are we all going to agree? No. We're not going to all agree. Uh, you know, I, I look at, at the way, you know, Congress is, is doing business these days, and it seems like it's all politicized. And, and, you know, all they're doing is, you know, you got one group who hates another group, and all they're doing is trying to, uh, to get that group out and, and nothing's being accomplished. Why? Because they're not working together. And I have found that in the church, there are times that there's people in the church you may not even like. Maybe their personality rubs you the wrong way or whatever. And that's true of jobs too, by the way. But what you do, is you realize you have a common goal. And you serve the same God. And Jesus Christ died for both of us. And we're going to work together to get something accomplished for the Lord. Love, love is what it takes to get this job done. And so I pray today that we would all find that, uh, that place in our hearts where we can fall in love with Jesus and love each other, even if we don't always agree with each other. I want to ask the musicians to come this morning. The invitation is always open here, whether we mention it or not. Sometimes we, we do, and sometimes we don't. But the invitation to come up, you can come up here and pray right here at this altar, or you can pray wherever you are. But it's really about a commitment. Once you begin to love, then it's about a commitment. And so as we begin this year out, I'm going to ask you to make a commitment. Last week, we... We talked about the commitments that we make when we become a member of the church or when we uh, take our baptismal vows, we make commitments. And I want to ask you to commit to God, first of all. Not necessarily to the church, but to God. And then God asks us to worship Him, and I'm going to ask you to commit to church, your church attendance this year. Yeah? And that's part of being a Christian. Commit to being the best Christian and then commit to wherever God will lead you. That's what you want to do.